Good morning, and this is Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy, and we're going to continue our discussion of S5 with our Legislative Council um, members. We have, well, we have an updated timeline, and um, this is a really great opportunity for you, ask, for you all to ask clarifying questions on the bill. We don't currently have an updated draft. We went through, I think we got through all the proposed changes that were in this re most recent draft. Um, and then <clears throat> hopefully you all went home and reread. And I did. So this is a great time for clarifying questions. Members. And are you looking for changes, suggested changes? Uh, sure. We think that folks have those. We can talk about them. Um, well, I've been gathering a bunch um, from our witnesses. Could walk through a number of them. Let's see if there's clarifying questions that okay. people have first. Um, that if you would like to go, you want to go through the timeline in its entirety again, or we can. It would be quicker. It would be quicker today, right? Because we just got to point out that in the current. Sure. Yes, um, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. So today I did provide you an updated timeline. Um, it fixed a few of the typos from yesterday. It also includes a couple of the, the updated dates that are in your first version of strike all amendment. Um, and so uh, as you move forward, these dates can be adjusted based on how you uh, respond to the changes in the bill. Um, but a couple of things, I also added a couple of the things that we talked about yesterday to the timeline, just trying to, again, this is an imperfect system because it's a chart, but add it, trying to add more things on here so that you can visually see where they fall. Um, so first, I uh, the third box, July 1, 2023, um, I moved the DPS potential study into that box um, because Currently, there isn't a due date in the um, draft, but they're going to start it presumably around July 1, 2023, when all that work gets underway. Um, additionally, right below that is another July 1 date that wasn't in the previous draft. And this is um, uh, acknowledges that the, the Department of Tax will need to start providing the fuel tax data to the PUC then. Uh, next, uh, um, uh, so additionally in the February 15th, 2024 box, um, your most recent draft had the funding source recommended by the PUC coming in February 15th, 2024. So that's moved into that box um, related to the uh, report that's also supposed to come back. And so I suspect they'll probably be in the same document. Uh, so additionally, um, June 1, 2024, there's a box added for that with the PUC appointing or contracting with a DDA. Um, your, uh, 1.1 draft does have June 1, 2024. Um, I know that you had some conversations around that yesterday, so I put a question mark next there in case that's not the final date you're going to land on. So then um, one of the, the next uh, sort of typo that I fixed was in the January 15th, 2025. So January 15th, 2025, the PUC are going to, they are going to submit the final rules to the legislature. Um, additionally, they do have to re also report back at that same time with a, a lot of other information, including the rules, but also the status update that includes all that economic analysis. Um, so we did talk about that yesterday. Um, but I think, again, it will probably come either in the same document or an, att an attached document with those rules in January 2025. Um, so on the next page, I did sort kind of questions. Thank you. Uh, when these rules 
the final rules come to the legislature in 2025, is it, is it going to be a vote upon or is it just going to be that's the way it is? No. So we're, we're going to either pass or, or fail this bill this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we voting on? Are we voting on just the study, correct? This year? Yeah. You are voting on the full substance of what is an S5, yep. which would authorize the PUC and the Department of Public Service to begin the work on this. However, they will not be able to enact final rules establishing the full details of the clean heat program until at least two years from now in 2025, when the rules come back to the legislature for review. So um, this is what I was going to lead to on the next page. Okay. And so you'll remember that yesterday I explained that when the rules come back to the General Assembly, the General Assembly is going to have multiple options of what they do with the rules. Um, so they will come to the whole General Assembly for review. The rules cannot be submitted for adoption and therefore take effect until there's enacted specific authorization to do so, and that would need to be a full bill passed by the General Assembly um, and then either uh, signed by the governor or, over, or have a veto override. Um, that bill can take a number of different forms. It could be as short as saying the legislature authorizes the PUC to submit its final rules for adoption. Or it could uh, direct the PUC to make any number of changes to the rules before they're adopted, or the um, statute uh, establishing the clean heat standard could be amended in any number of ways to dictate what else should be in the rule or what should not be in the rule. Um, and then additionally, and this is, I added this on the, the um, timeline after the legislature acts, if they do enact legislation with authorization, the rules then will also go to LCAR. And then at LCAR, and I added this on here, the, led, the members of LCAR, which are eight legislators, will review the rules in the statutory criteria. So they will look at whether or not the PUC exceeded their authority at all, whether or not the, the rules are within the legislative intent, whether any of the rules are arbitrary, if they're stylistically sound. And they will also review the economic analysis and the environmental analysis that are required additionally. And so we haven't talked about that a lot in here, but generally the Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking does require an additional environmental analysis and economic analysis. So even after the full legislature passes authorization, LCAR will still have another chance to review the rules and could actually further dictate further changes if they also find something in the rules um, that are a problem. So in short, right now, we will be voting on a bill that we won't know what the results are. You are voting to, to establish a statute on the clean heat standard that will then initiate work at the PUC to develop the program, which will then come back to the legislature. That's that part. Okay. Right here. Thank you. That helps. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is a lot of what I covered on the second page of the timeline. So I realized that as I was talking about it yesterday, um, <coughs> one um, sort of description in the, the bill itself. But so the, the rules are going to come to the legislature in January of 2025. If the legislature passes um, a law, to the PUC will be allowed to file the final rule. Um, and so I'm, I speculate that could be between May and July, which is when the majority of bills are enacted into law in the General Assembly. It could be earlier, it could be later, um, but not until that happens, can the PUC then submit the final rules to the Secretary of State and LCAR, and then LCAR will receive them and do another review with those steps I just met. Um, and then they cannot take effect. So uh, rules, uh, we haven't talked about it too much the APA process here, but rules um, state in them when they will take effect. Um, they cannot take effect for at least 15 days after they have been um, approved. 
So at the very least, if LCAR moved as fast as possible, that could potentially be June. Um, but sometimes rules also include a date certain when they will take effect. And so it could be um, mo much more than two weeks. So it could be a couple of months. Um, so it's a little bit unclear when the rules will actually take effect. And that will depend on when the legislature acts and what date is actually included in the final rules that go to LCAR, which is something the legislature would have control over when they review the rules in 2025. Representative Tory. Um, so the rulemaking that we're talking about here or the rules that we're talking about can we just refer back to the to S5, just specifically where they're mentioned? Is it 8126? No, so if you look at the third column on, uh, on the timeline. Yeah, so primarily what I'm talking about is um, in section 6F. Um, it is also discussed in 8126 um, because that's um, the PUC's general rulemaking authority. That rulemaking authority will last as long as the statute lasts. Um, but the process for the initial rulemaking, this sort of um, hybrid system of rulemaking you're creating here, is in Section 6F. And can you remind me the sections of the APA that are omitted from this statute? And that they're omitted because the public process is already embedded here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a number of steps that are required under the APA that would be um, potentially redundant or less restrictive than what you're doing in this bill. You're mandating more public engagement that is normal than in what is normally required under the APA. Any questions you want to go through the bill on? Or Okay, just the one to right and just stand was the what page again? Oh, I'm sorry, page five of the new version. The discussion yesterday, I didn't follow up yesterday, but I didn't really understand the whatever it was was talking about. But I'm, okay, line 11, lines 11 and 12 on page five. Um, when we describe what you can cut as. And then that we asked us to take away the 60% at the bottom of that and what that actually meant. Somebody can help me with that. I have some edits, some suggested language changes that came from that was via HFI. Yeah. It was yeah. at least one of our witnesses yesterday, I think, yeah. who spoke to supporting it. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Representative Sevilla. Uh, so in five, a uh, customer with low income means a customer with a household income of up to 60% of the area or statewide mean income, whichever is greater. We have a page number. Page, page five. five. Five, five, I didn't hear that. Page five, line seven. It's, uh, it's the definition of a uh, customer with low income and customer with moderate income. So customer with low income means a customer with a household income of up to 60% of the area or statewide, that's a change, median income, whichever is greater. Uh, and then moving to six, customers with moderate income means a customer with a household income between 60% and 120% of area or statewide median income, whichever is greater. Representative Sevens. Thanks, Spencer. I, I would support that. I think we've heard both appreciation for um, articulating this clearly, but then we've also heard a uh, request to ensure that as we articulate it, we're not making it, um, number one, confusing, and number two, something that means that there's a cliff and they can't provide support. Uh, 
Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, and as I recall, VHFA was uh, suggesting that we drop the 60% out of, yeah. the, of the bottom from customer with moderate income. Right. But I know that there was further conversation among people yesterday that said maybe a change needs to be in the percentage of clean heat measures delivered to low and moderate income households. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I have that change in here as well. Pages out. That's page eleven. Is that on page? Yes, that's where it is. Page eleven, the bottom number two is where the sixteen percent are mentioned. Then it's seven. Um. So from the submitted testimony from VHFA, what they also asked was to remove the floor. Right. That was yes. at 60%. Right. But I think there's an changes. alternate suggestion, right? Just in a different location, I think, is what we're talking about. Okay. Can I ask why? Because then the definitions would overlap. Exactly. Yeah. Then the would, definitions what? But then they would overlap. So someone... I think it's to make it more inclusive. I can read this. If that's but, yeah, but it's fine. Do you want me to read what she, what she submitted? Okay. I have a suggested change from her, incorporated edit from her. Right, but let's let's cover the why okay. for a second. Okay. As written in section eighty one twenty three, the definition for moderate income has a floor of sixty percent AMI, meaning that low income households are not eligible for the moderate income benefits. We'd ask the committee to change that so that the definition of, quote, customer with moderate income, end quote, are those with incomes below 120% of median income. The impact would be that the lowest income Vermonters would be included in both the low and moderate income categories. So the concern is that having the floor keeps the low income from being able to access moderate income opportunities. But presumably, the low income opportunities would be greater. Presumably. So I don't fully understand it either, right. Representative Logan. Yeah, I, I kind of get it because there are some programs that go up to 80% AMI. Um, I understand the idea behind just wanting to make low income households eligible for all programs that serve everybody under the 120% AMI, but it also does mean that low income folks are both low income and moderate income, which is a weird way to do a definition. But I think there's a suggestion about how to keep that definition clear, but also make sure that the benefits are flowing generously. Okay, so on page 11. This is uh, 8124 Clean Heat Standard Compliance E2. A suggested change of their annual requirement. Each obligated party shall retire at least 16% from customers with low income. And there's new words, an additional 16% from customers with low or moderate income. Mm -hmm. And change from them further down. Yeah. Right. Looks so good with this one. Representative Bond. Let's just play it out. I just want to play it out a little bit. There, there is then the potential for the reverse to happen. <laughs> that all the credits end up going to low income and moderate income gets high. And I don't think credits are going anywhere, but if, it, but, if it's, right. but if the low income category goes all the way up, then what happens yeah. eventually to the middle? 
Representative Smith. It sounds to me like this language is going to confuse many different groups of people, uh, of whether they're low income or moderate income. Someone with a moderate income is going to end up finding out they're not in a moderate income. I don't think there's real good clarification as to who's going to get what and what's going to get who here. Mm -hmm. I'll note that it does say at least. So it's not restricted. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm just having thought based on the chart Mora from VHFA showed us yesterday about the breakdown of low and moderate income households, home ownership versus rental. Um, and lower and moderate income homeowners, um, there were there were more moderate income homeowners than there were low income homeowners. And so programs like the one that VHFA was talking about that serve those under 120% AMI are for homeowners. So there's just some programs that are for homeowners that qualify, like the RAP funding, for example, for weatherization, because um, that's a financing program for folks who own their home. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It does seem like this gives a lot of flexibility to the providers um, to maximize the resources that they have available to them and you know target the right people, but it also doesn't provide clear direction. You're saying. Mm -hmm. Representative Sebelia. So the credits. <clears throat> Pricing will also factor in values um, here. Just kind of this is. I think this is one we should sit with, and okay. yeah, we'll, we'll consider this change and okay. move on to others. We're just, you know, we're not deciding right now. We're thinking. We're getting ideas on the table so that we can think about them and decide next week. Uh, you want me to go to the next one or? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, if, yes, let's do that. In that section? Sure. Okay. Uh, on page 12, number four, line nine here. Uh, so with consideration, to how to on how to best serve customers, we have a consideration to how to best serve customers with low income, moderate income. The commission shall have the authority to uh, get rid of the word change and make that word increase the percentages established in subdivision two of this subsection mm -hmm. for good cause. After consultation with the energy. Okay. That's just, that seems just clarifying. No. Um, mm -hmm. mm, no. Not the right. last one. <laughs> what? Ellen. So so I would respond. Um, why would you increase the credits if there is a credit shortage? So you so the second sentence is good cause could include credit shortage or undue financial impacts. So I do think that change is neutral about whether or not they could increase or decrease, and that was intentional about harm or shortage of credits. So if there are not funds available or not sufficient funds available to um, get credits from low income work. This is a circuit breaker for not requiring because it could lead to price impacts. Um, and as you mentioned on the prior page, it's at least 16%. So there is already some suggestion that it could be increased from 16%. 
this would also potentially allow them to increase it from 16%. So I think change is probably the proper word, unless you also want to change what the cause is. Just another question mark on that one. Well, go ahead, Senator Bonner. While we're on this page, yeah. um, so when we're done filling it up, are we? Yep. Okay. While we're on this page, um, number five, on line 15, we had this discussion. Maybe Laura had to do a plan if you have language for this or not, but the um, <clears throat> um, commission shall take into account participants. In a way, yesterday, as I understand it, we were sort of saying the commission shall not take into account as we were to have in this discussion, right? Because we don't want this to say that the fact that you are getting something from some other part of government, federal or otherwise, doesn't stand in the way of being able to access the credits or the markets or the work being contemplated here. And are we so? In determining whether to, I guess my question is almost, do we need this section at all? I'll just posit that. Um, to ex so in determining whether to exceed the minimum percentages of clean heat measures that must be delivered to customers with low income and moderate income, the commission shall take into account for just if nothing else. I asked the question, what does that mean? Sure. So, oh, does that mean? No. Yeah, do you want to? Do you want our I, state of council to I, respond? So I do think this language is awkward, and I have wondered if it should just be added to four. So if the if there is an interest in requiring more than sixteen percent from the low and mid middle income customers, that could come from information regarding how many customers are using other state-sponsored government programs and therefore already getting these incentives. And so if, for example, we hear that LIHEAP has a large amount of customers in it, that would suggest potentially that a large amount of customers are accumulating credits and therefore obligated parties will be able to have more than 16% of their credits coming from the low-income customer. Base. So I do think the language is a little awkward, but it's, it's acknowledged that if for some reason there is a large amount of credits potentially being generated by a government sponsored low income program, that does suggest that there's a lot of low income credits on the market. So the aim, so that the 16% could be increased. And maybe we could, I could say that a little better in some language tweaking, but um, I do think it's an awkward sentence. <laughs> And I think Representative Sebelia has a thought on it, although I don't know if your thoughts change based on that discussion. I mean, it, 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 it very well may, but uh, the suggestion that was made here um, by the Jeff A and others was to add a sentence at five at the end, participation in other government sponsored low income and moderate income weatherization programs did not limit the availability of clean heat measures available to those households by nature of that participation. So I do hope that this sentence uh, in five isn't suggesting, I think there's an overall policy in this bill that incentives should be stacked. So I've never read five to suggest otherwise. Um, so, Potentially that language would help, or maybe incorporating some of those words into five might help. Um, and isn't that elsewhere in the bill? Yeah. Yeah. It could be, where, where else do you? Um, so it is in the section on uh, credits. So I believe that's 8127. Um, and it is, yes, in credit eligibility. So page 26 onto page 27. Uh, 
And so on page 26, it describes that the credits can be um, created regardless of who does the work or who funded it, regardless of if it's required by state or federal um, programs, um, or which, which would include low income weatherization and tier three. Um, so that can, uh, they can count towards those policy goals as well as create clean heat credits. <clears throat> I guess it's different though. I mean, it's one is saying like to eliminate you from participation, and the other is saying they can have, they can count. Other thoughts on this suggested? The council's going to take them back and some language. Sure. If if the issue is participation, I think that is right. That it isn't necessarily addressed in that later section. Um, so yeah, I can, I can try to rewrite this to be more clear. It, basically, it, it's um, notwithstanding. Hey. It's a, oh. Oh. Yeah. Woo. Sorry about that. Is that your kid? Yeah, oh. Apparently, oh. I did not. Oh. Oh. I'm really glad they're oh. not on the floor. Are there paddles in here? <laughs> 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 Everybody, check your phone. Make sure it's muted. Sorry. Mine went off on the floor this morning. Oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry about so that. The volume Everybody's on. We are. Sorry, <laughs> Representative Sacrifice. We should you, just. Oh, are you, yeah, how's that silent mode going? Why are you calling me? I am not. At any rate. Where are we? Well, we just finished. Hold on a minute. Is that Morris? Were you asking? Yeah, right. So, just for my clarity, number five, and I admit we have some thoughts about maybe striking it or changing and amending it and putting it to four, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, this it's notwithstanding participation in other programs, correct? That's what we're thinking. Here. You can do. You, you can do all. Yeah, you're, stack, you're stackable. It shouldn't limit. Just because you participated in one doesn't mean you're not eligible for this. Correct. So and, and so and I think that this conversation around four and five together um, came up a lot last year as well as this year about was sixteen percent and sixteen percent the right numbers and so that's why there's this sort of this language in both of these that sort of allow well the PUC could find that it, it should be less because we don't have enough credits. Or the PUC could find that it should be more because we have more credits. Yeah. Um, Representative Tory. Um, would there be a situation where there's fewer credits because some of these related programs are experiencing barriers, either financial funding barriers or some other barriers? Because it seems like this market's going to be a really good picture of more uh, of a lot of different successes and issues, you know, as it grows, or if it were to flatline, for example, we, we would be learning and gain, gaining insight into, you know, a lot of, a lot of potential, um, so it'd be like a barometer, but it just, it just occurs to me that the reasons for the credits to shrink could be complex. Yes. Representative Stevens. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, just for like, for my brain in terms of how we approach this bill and talking about it, I think that the two pieces that um, I really, well, one of the pieces that I heard clearly from the PUC was the request for flexibility. Um, and yet also there is the request for some specificity so that we're providing clear enough directions. And I guess, uh, so to the point of specifying participation in other government sponsored low income, like that second request from the HFA to make sure that the stacking can occur, that feels helpful. The, the comments about modifying the word from change to increase feels like that might not be helpful on the flip side. Yeah.
Okay, moving on. Your next suggestion yes. is F2. F2. Uh, here, see, this has to do with the compliance. Bottom of page 13, number two. Yeah. Uh, so this has to do with the compliance payment. Um, so actually, going on over to page 14. Uh, we've heard a lot about this. Of the non compliance payment shall be four times the amount established by the commission for timely per credit payments to the default delivery agent. So we have a suggestion to add under here A, the commission may waive the non compliance payment required by this subdivision to an obligated party which failed to retire the number of clean heat credits required in the preceding year if the commission, uh, colon, number one, uh, one, finds the obligated party made a good faith effort to achieve that required amount and its failure to achieve that amount resulted from market factors beyond its control and, and, uh, two directs the obligated party to add the difference between the clean heat credits required to be retired and the clean heat credits the obligated party actually retired for that year to its required amount for one or more future years. So uh, it's demonstrable that market forces were the problem and they take the difference between what they did, what, what they were obligated, what they did, and they add it to um, one or more future years. So Representative Clifford. So in, in that, does that strike the four times? It does not. No, it leaves the four times. It leaves the four times, but it says that the commission may waive that. And it lists the conditions by which they might wait. If there were market forces that caused them to miss, and uh, and if the obligated to so they miss it, so they say, uh, "Here's our commitment." Uh, okay, we missed it. Here's why we missed it. We missed it because of the market, and also here's the amount we missed. We're going to apply that into next year, the year after, three years after. What have you? So, you know, if we were obligated for 10, we hit eight, we missed by two. And here's the reason that that happened <clears throat> because of the market. And we're going to take those two and apply it to next year or the year after three years down to our obligation. Understand? Representative Bonner, am I being clear? I, I agree. I'm not the word about the section of that <laughs> Read literally. We have, we have the assurance that they have the authority to do it anyway. But read literally, this does say that there's no way, suggests no leeway. And I think there should be some leeway. And I might even add something like faith effort it's in into this, in, in yeah. addition to market forces, something around. It. I don't think we want to. Well, anyway. It says good faith already. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you share this? Uh, these, this is just a compilation of edits that I have put together. So I can, if you'd like, or so, it might be easier for members. So anyway, that, okay. this is headed in the right direction. Okay. Uh, I think. Yes. I mean, Ellen may have, I'd like to hear your. Sure. So it sounds like it's setting up a difference between a good faith effort to comply and a bad faith effort. So bad faith would be ignoring that you needed to comply in the first place and made no attempts to comply. Whereas good faith is having some kind of demonstration that you attempted to comply and then identifying what pre prevented you from complying and saying you will pay it in a later year. So I do think you have options. That is, is an option. You could change the shall to a may in the, the penalty statute generally. You could go in a different direction if you don't want to do a four times multiplier. Um, uh, I did look into this. Uh, 
I got some feedback from the other attorneys in the office. Um, there are a few statutes um, in the environmental realm, particularly that um, go with double times penalties for aggregating factors, um, particularly in the hunting realm. If you have additional aggregating factors, it's double the, the standard penalty that's already in the statute. Um, in litigation, if damages are assessed and there are mitigating factors, there can be triple damages, what's known as treble damages. So that's another one. In the tax world, um, failure to pay your income tax is a multiplier of a percentage of your uh, your tax liability. Um, and so uh, different multipliers are in statute in various ways. Um, but broadly, the rest of the PUC's statute for penalty are um, specified amounts that the PUC cannot exceed when ass asserting a penalty. So if you don't want to go with the structure that's here, you do have options on how to craft a penalty in a different way. Thank you for that. That's good. Reporting on your homework. <laughs> it was. And I have some other specific examples. Mike uh, O'Grady sent me a bunch of examples if you'd like to see other ones specifically, but there are, there are different ways um, to craft a penalty. Um, and I didn't find that are any exactly like this. Um, I would also point out that currently in the renewable energy statute, um, the renewable energy standard, which is somewhat similar to this, there's a statutory amount for the penalty. Um, and so it sets what is sort of the credit price in statute. And that happened in 2015. Prior to that, the, the Public Service Board was setting, I think annually, um, but they were setting the per credit compliance price in rule. And it's significantly different than the current price. In the testimony, I reviewed testimony this morning, and then the, it's a pretty big difference. Between, I think, between the current price and what's in statute. Yes. The statute is much higher. Yes, and that is to act as sort of the last resort, right. and it helps the market. And so there was some idea here to try to do that. Um, so, but there are slightly different choices in this bill because it is a slightly different system. Yeah, I get that. Okay. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just so the committee knows, uh, the four times penalty is going to be a, a problem for me, uh, up to a four times penalty. I, I'm appreciating the language that is being suggested now that in the options that are available in perhaps the discretion, but uh, the four times penalty is, uh, uh, I am having a difficult time supporting that. Uh, the goal here is to uh, provide incentives for low income, moderate income to change over to uh, alternative heating measures. Uh, and this section appears uh, headed towards putting uh, potentially some dealers out of business. And that's the part that I'm struggling with. I, I, I'd like to focus on the incentives uh, as opposed to penalizing. Yeah. That's my opinion. Just like and then Smith. Yeah, uh, I hear you. Um, one of the things that I've heard clearly from the fuel dealers for years on this is the need to ensure compliance by all a fairness factor. And so, you know, this is one of those places where uh, we, uh, you know, it, <clears throat> if one or you know, if, if there are a set of fuel dealers who are able to just, you know, or who, if the penalty is not sufficient enough for the obligated party and you potentially are um, risking unfairness to the others in terms of compliance. So I, although I am, I hear you and I'm happy myself to also think about, you know, how we could further temper that. <laughs> Um, the waiver feels pretty um, substantial. Try that on, Representative Smith and Simmons. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Representative Morris. The, these dealers aren't going to know if you, you're going to uh, four times the amount. Is it going to be three hundred dollars? Is it going to be thirty thousand dollars? No one knows. We won't know until after the study happens. And. For the last six years, I've been trying to get a texting and driving bill through, and I've been told by 
powers to be that you don't we we don't feel comfortable about finding Vermonters. And that's why my bill has been stalling. Or one of the reasons. My attitude might be another one, but anyway, I don't think it's right to find Vermonters when they don't know what they're going to be fined or the amount. That's that's my take on it. Evanson and Clifford. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Sibilia. I, I am interested in the um, language that you mentioned. I also, I, I understand your point about the need for compliance. I also, uh, to me, it seems like, to me, it, I, I typically am looking for reference points in terms of consistency with how we go about business broadly. Um, and, you know, I personally, when the PUC was here and they said, you know, more typically you see treble or three times, that seems, this just seem, seems to me a little bit like, you know, and I, that is not the point of this bill. Um, so I, I would be interested in three times as opposed to four times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Representative Flicker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I was going to bring that up and look for like a compromise of middle ground. I was even going to ask if we would consider two, two times. I, mean, I know the language of what and what the Senate discussed was the three, the three. But I was, you know, we're going to, you know, either not do it or I mean, I, I think the, your language covers a lot of that. What the what the PUC has the, in, in control of, but with the even. Hope that we could even go with two instead of four, but that's I'm just throwing that out there. Things for us to think about. Shall I continue? Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, three, four, three, five. Uh, looking at the default page, uh, page 15, 1.1. This is looking at the default delivery agent. Uh, and there are a number of suggested edits here from both Proficiency Vermont and business. Um, so starting with, let's see. E A A page eighteen to nineteen. So I'll open up the seat. Yeah. Yeah. Page eighteen. Yes. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Actually, on page 18, starting with, um, and here we're at the potential study. So there's language around the potential study. A potential study conducted by the Department <laughs> of Public Service to include an assessment and quantification of <coughs> technically available, maximum achievable, and program achievable <laughs> resources. And we heard that from both um, Dave Westman and Rich Cowart in terms of what potential studies typically consider. Continuing on, the results shall include a comparison <laughs> to the legal obligations of the thermal sector portion of the GWSA and 10 BSA 578. The potential study shall consider and evaluate market conditions for delivery of clean heat measures within the state, including an assessment of workforce characteristics capable of meeting consumer demand and towards meeting the obligations of the GWSA and BSA 578. That's an A. 
going on to be the development of a three-year plan and associated proposed budget by the default delivery agent, new language, to be informed by the final results of the department's potential study. The DDA may propose a portion of its budget towards promotion and market uplift, workforce development, and trainings for clean heat measures. These activities shall be eligible for earning a proportional share of clean heat credits pursuant to 8127. Stop right there. I do have additional, one additional in G here if folks still have questions. Maybe cancel this. Thoughts on that, Representative? I'm going to try that language on. I'm going to say it's a good sign. That's what I want to try on. Yes. Representative Tory, then Logan. I probably just missed this, but the follower in the potential study, that section. Um, do we have a date when it's due? Well, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think we heard yesterday, um, I think it was from Alan, but um, that's the. Uh, Earlier this week, I think, if you're talking about uh, Mr. Westman's testimony. Yeah, so I think we've heard that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I did ask David Wesson when he was here how long they have, they take to mm -hmm. conduct. And so he said nine to 12 months. Right. So there'll need to be some time for them to figure out who the consultant is going to be to do this work. Um, it's slightly unclear to me if they have a standard consultant they use currently for the potential studies they already do, um, or if it may take longer time because this is more specialized work. Um, but if they already have a consultant, Six to nine months may be the reasonable number. After July. Yeah. After July. Represents uh, actually Logan. Do we have the um, document that you're using, Laura, yet? Any chance? I have not sent it. Or for me to take that in. This is a copy of that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I this calendar uh, timeline that Ledge Council gave us today. I had sort of tweaked it, if this is at all helpful, for July 1st, 2023. EPES uh, releases a potential study RFP, and then it's really more like September 2024 would be when the potential study is uh, September 1st. Uh, yeah, would be when the potential study was completed. So that would give like 12 months for the RFP announcement selection contract plus completion, which is tight, but just in terms of putting in a timeline. I did want to ask another question, if that's okay, somewhat related to this. Mm -hmm. Um, so this language, I believe, is from Efficiency Vermont. That's where I printed up my version from Dave Westman. Um, if we're putting this language, if we're trying this language on, does that mean that the conversation we had earlier this week where the credit value for your comment, Representative Morris, how credit value is obtained, that language with regards to workforce. We were saying that maybe that seemed a little odd there. <laughs> is this where it would be instead? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Can you say that one more time? Sorry. Yes. So I am looking for it right now. We have uh, credit value. 
It was under um, credit ownership. So it's later in the bill um, under maybe page 20. 21. 21. Yep. So, right. Thank you. Um, so it's page 21 lines like uh, specifically line 18, 19. Yeah. Yes. And that, that had felt a little odd during yes. the people talking about whether or not that seemed appropriate. Yes. And means. this seems more appropriate yeah. in terms of what we're trying to say. I agree. Me too. Okay. Uh, the uh, next. Think about care. So when we talk about allowing credits to be used for workforce development, training, perhaps, is there a, is there any implication here that there's going to be a, a limit on that? I mean, the goal is to get uh, alternative heating sources into homes. Uh, I'm just wondering if it could be all consumed by workforce and. You don't actually achieve. In other words, the credits can be spent in future years. We're allowing for that. Uh, just concerned that, and I recognize workforce development is necessary. What is going to argue that? I don't think. But if there's other funding mechanisms or um, programs that are currently available, if we're not, I won't say double dipping, but if we're creating um, the spending of the credits here for workforce that could be covered in other areas, and that the, uh, the goal of reducing fossil fuel use is spent on training the workforce. Yeah, the, the way I see that, it was it would be that the potential study would include those other programs in our ability to have the workforce. But right. But I would say I. Go ahead, Ellen. So I, I haven't uh, seen the direct language that Representative Sebelia just read, but I think by moving it to the budget section, it would not be related to credits, but it would be allowing the VBA to set in their budget some funding for workforce specifically, so not related to the actual cre awarding credits. <clears throat> I think that's what it said, but I haven't. The proportional. Yeah. But uh, that is something you could work on if that's where you wanted to. Yeah. That may propose a portion of its budget to go towards promotion, market uplift, workforce. It's hard not seeing the language, Representative Morris, but yeah. basically it, it takes it out of that credit piece that we right. were discussing the other day. No, but it, so it does go on to say that these activities shall be eligible for earning a proportional share of clean heat credits. So I just want a public service announcement. The, edits that Laura, I mean, she worked really hard overnight to get these to us and compile them so we could um, do this. And if others have suggestions, we're open to those as well. They're now posted. Um, but I think in acknowledgement that this is a work in process, I just want to say like, this, I think completed, you thought, your thoughts were compiled as recently as this morning. So thank you for doing the homework and sharing it. Um, so then, then what I just said though was slightly was inaccurate because I hadn't. So it's that second part where earning a proportional share of credits. So that may be something you want to consider. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for posting them, by the way. Uh, Representative Logan, um, I just wanted to note while we're discussing this topic that I've been in communication with Efficiency Vermont, who provided the original language in the credit ownership section uh, to reference market uplift activities such as workforce and mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. um, and so this language <coughs> is in the budget section on the potential study considering, who's the DDA, by the way? Designated so, delivery agent. Okay, yeah. sorry. Thank you. Default delivery agent may propose a portion of its budget. I think that they were actually not just assuming that it would be the designated delivery agent. It could be also, for example, EHFA, who's providing finance mechanisms. So I'm not, where did this 
language come from regarding the potential study? So this, uh, this piece has come from the sufficiency. This was part of their edits. It's maybe part of other business edits. So I think there's a lot of complexity potentially in including this as part of the credits. PUC yesterday said that this just seemed. Yeah. I mean, this is how renewable energy credits are already working. I think it's just that we're we're discussing it for the first time as it, we didn't realize what all was packaged in to the distribution of ownership for credits. And I'm, so I'm happy to talk about the response that Efficiency Vermont has given in that credit ownership section, because I know we had also separately discussed moving that language that they provided into the credit uh, valuation section. And they responded to say that they um, don't still don't think that that's the appropriate place for that language, but I don't want to get off topic from this potential study language. So we can talk about the other piece at any point. All right, I think we're still just trying stuff on. Think about it. See it. We may see it again next in the next iteration. Present to me. Quick question, because foggy today. Remind me how what the process for determining the um, greenhouse gas emission um, value that a credit gets assigned. Who does that happen as part of the tag? Yes. Okay. So if workforce is going to be given some value in the credit. I just want to make sure that the tag has workforce related participants, which I think we would do EBT, but we might think more broadly about workforce. So, um, I just want, uh, yeah, I can't remember where the tag is. Just getting one pointing to that section. On 28, thank you. Present budget seems the budget for the default delivery agent seems different to me than what a credit the greenhouse gas emission reduction credit is. So I'll just flag that um, that's why I thought it made more sense to put it in the budget than to have it as the credit ownership. And so it sounds to me like there's a couple, like there's possibly two separate things happening. Whether or not you want to build a workforce into a credits value or whether you want to give credits for workforce. It, um, it's maybe not quite right, but go ahead, Representative Logan. So it makes sense to include those considerations in the budget and the potential study. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we can like, all agree on. We want to know how much it's going to cost, right? Those activities. So that's a separate question than if, and this is, so I guess I'll just, um, I can forward the email that I received to, from Efficiency Vermont onto everyone. I sent it to committee leadership this morning, I believe. Um, let's see, so Dave Westman, um, says, um, I believe the on matters such as these, the most important consideration is that the legislator, legislature direct the TAG to address this topic. The TAG will not take action on credit allocation among the many parties responsible for it. <laughs> yeah, distracting. Um, so the tag will not take action on credit allocation among the many parties responsible for implementing a clean heat project unless directed to do so by the legislature, where it shows up in the legislation can be something of a moving target, he admits. But 
he believes, so Dave uh, Westman from Efficiency Vermont believes the language is best suited in the section on credit ownership um, because that section is dealing with who owns credits once a project is complete. There may be one or more parties who should earn credits from a single project and those credits should be allocated proportionally once the project is completed. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So I have a suggestion. I would love to work with um, folks around this issue at lunchtime, maybe, if that's possible. Would that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Moving on. So that specifically is the um, workforce issue, and not the market uplift. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, moving on to page 19. Still here in the default delivery agent. Um, and specific programs. This is a request from a conglomeration of business interests that we <clears throat> modify this. Uh, and here it would be that specific program, talking about specific programs, and that the default delivery agent shall create specific programs for multi unit dwellings, condo associations, renters, manufactured homes, comma and commercial and industrial customers. So these groups have an equitable opportunity to benefit from the clean standard. So I think this is clarifying language. I think that um, uh, commercial and industrial is already part of, um, but I think this gives, um, other, another group of Vermonters, some, some assurances that they are also included in the standard. standard. Representative Stevens, that, that seems like a no brainer to me. Um, I mean, our current efficiency programs, um, understanding that whoever the DDA would be is going to go through an entire process to be identified, but our current efficiency programs provide services to commercial industrial and I mean that's there if if we if we don't provide services to these customers then we're not um, going in the right direction so that one seems like a no-brainer to me. Representative Clifford. Sure I just was wondering in renters how how does that affect landlords in any way? Is that because if a renter has to get permission or does not say here. Hmm? Does not say here. I guess the question is, what do you mean? So renters are potentially at a disadvantage because they don't have a control over their property, um, and so this is agnostic about that, about what type of program. Um, I've assumed this meant incentive program. Okay. Um, but it's asking the DDA to create specific programs for renters and these other types of units that are different than a homeowner owning the house and can make changes to it. That's what that's so it isn't clear what type of program it's going to be created, but I will stop there. Representative Bongar. Just to follow up on this, pull it apart, pick up on what Representative Clifford said. Is, it, is the program would actually be for land? For what? Landlords of, of a rental of a, apartments um, benefit renters, but wouldn't the program and the incentives actually adhere to the landlord? I guess it is very vague on the specific type of program that could be created. So potentially not, or maybe. I think it's it would be both. Yeah. Representative Logan. Yep. Um, thank you. So this is the split incentive issue that we've been talking about. Um, and I think one of the things that would make these programs more accessible to renters is if they were able to be the initiating party in, 
in accessing the program um, and then would need their landlord's permission, but they would go through the, they would be able to go through the process themselves of applying to take advantage of a particular benefit. So this is the issue that has been faced in the past is that it had to be a landlord taking the initiative and then there needed to be permission for that landlord to qualify on the basis of the income of their tenants. So we need to make that clear that that, that um, the landlord can qualify to participate in programs <coughs> of the low or moderate income status of their tenants, but we would also be best practice to allow tenants to initiate participation in a program as well. That's a good point. Representative Smith. Thank you. Um, if a tenant, say a, in a duplex, two, two tenants want heat pumps and they get the landlord's permission to go ahead and have the heat pumps installed, yeah. uh, chances are the landlord's going to be out of the income bracket to qualify for it, but the tenants will qualify for it. So two years down the road, these tenants decide they want to move on somewhere else. Do they take the heat pumps with them? Um, no, I just want to know. <laughs> they will belong to the landlord. They would belong on the property. So I do think it would belong to the owner of the property, the landlord or whoever the, yep. yeah. Something else. Thank you. I think the original intention of this language was to make kind of an association that was supportive of targeting low income. And so now if we add the commercial and industrial, then do we have to add single family? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that wasn't the intent of this section originally, and I'm not against it. I do think it's fine to be explicit that commercial and industrial customers surely should benefit from this, but equitable. And then is there anything left for single families? Um, I mean, I don't know um, how this affects others. Yeah, and I think also, and maybe the word shouldn't be renter, maybe it should be rental properties, uh, but it's these are types of properties that have perhaps challenges right. uh, that are unique to the property type in, in getting clean heat measures. Yeah, which commercial industrial probably are too, but the, I think everyone has challenges. <laughs> so that's the why we're doing this. Uh, I have that concern. I would also have said that this was on the on the list of provisions that were added right at the end of the Senate. Okay. Um, and so, yes, I do think there was equity concern, um, but also they didn't necessarily have a ton of time to flesh out the specifics of what these programs could be. Okay. All right. What we're going to try to do is get through as many of these as we can and then incorporate them into the next draft to continue this next week. So I'm just Let's keep going. The next one. Okay. Um, so. Representative Bonsberg. So what we're really saying here, or we might want to say, is to just develop a program for each category. Yeah. Thanks. Great. So which wouldn't <laughs> to include kind of everything, but it makes it then easier for those people in that category to know what the program is for them. So yeah, this may go, back, this may go back to one of your questions on another one is the section necessary. Okay. What do we get? What's the added benefit here? I think the added benefit are that nowhere else in the bill do they discuss unit dwelling specifically or condos. Yeah. Um, renters are mentioned and so are manufactured homes, but um, there was discussion in the Senate about how they could address these other different types of buildings. And so, yes, you may not need this here. You could be more broad and include other types. Um, 
but I think they had heard testimony on these different building types and wanted to acknowledge them. And that's so that's back to your point of consistency, rental units, uh, commercial industrial buildings. We're going to be kind of parallel in the construction. All right, next up. Okay. Uh, next, we are moving to uh, let's see. Let's see where we are. E three one is fine. We have really not Lego baseball. This is where uh, obligated party shall meet its annual requirement through a designated delivery, to, through a designated default delivery agent appointed by the commission, which is in section. I think you're you're talking about page seventeen. We're going backwards, Alan. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> I think that's what you were reading. Yes. I think you're right. Uh, so, and actually, page 18. Okay. So, this is the oh, plan of approval. What's that? Plan approval? Plan approval. Okay. And of the default delivery agent, E3, on page 18. Uh, this. Um, so, right here, um, I am going to suggest we need to figure out how to um, two, three, one. It's a different one. Capital D. Can you give me another? An obligated party shall meet its annual requirement through a designated default delivery agent appointed by the commission. However, the obligated party may be approved by the commission to meet its requirement in whole or in part through one of the following ways. So I think you're compliance. inserting it here. 17. You're inserting it in here. Thing. Adding a D. Maybe because it doesn't exist. Yet. 19. Yeah. It would go after the C. I think so that language you just language. it does exist. Are you trying to move it or change it? I'm trying to highlight it and talk about it. Okay, so it's on page 17. The point was that it you wanted to add some language that said yes, there it is. D1. No, it's not D three one. It's D one. D one. Okay, my apologies. No, it's there. No worries. Um, so uh, here, um, I think we need to um, think about uh, what this what this says right now is that um, you uh, you have to meet your credits through the DDA unless the DDA approves a plan that you bring forward. And there's been some concern uh, by industry that has brought, been brought forward um, that that really gives a lot of discretion to um, the commission and uh, that we might look at um, how to uh, kind of soften that so that uh, plans would be approved, provided that they, they have sufficient resources, uh, like workforce and other. So the concern here is, the concern from the PUC is, uh, here I am, single person saying, I will be installing 10,000 heat pumps this year. And 
the PUC has no means of uh, doing anything. So they're just going to say, no, we don't approve that. Uh, and industry is saying, well, but if we propose something and we say we've got sufficient resources, you know, we kind of demonstrate that we should be able to do that. PUC shouldn't be. So I think we should ask Ellen to work on this language just a little bit more. Yeah, so it doesn't currently set a standard by which the PUC should judge a plan. So I think this is adding clarity of what a plan needs to include for the PUC, roughly what it needs to include for the PUC to approve it. Yes. Yeah. Um, moving on, now that I'm reoriented, page three, or page 18. So sorry, page 18, number three. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here, I believe this is also an efficiency vermont request. Uh, commission shall by rule or order establish a standard timeline uh, or suggestion, I should say. The commission shall by rule or order establish a standard timeline under which the default delivery agent credit cost or costs are established and by which an obligated party must file its election form. We'd add in the default delivery agents schedule of costs shall include sufficient costs to deliver installed measures <coughs> and shall specify separately the cost to deliver measures to customers with low income and customers with moderate income as required by subsection 8124D of this title. Going down to four. It, yes. Go ahead, Gabriel. The, the rationale for that is just to clearly show where the budget is going or what? Yes. Yeah, I do think that's already implicit, but that is a, a clear statement of what I think the intent already is. Be assured. Four. I would add, uh, <clears throat> so four says the default delivery agent shall deliver creditable, clean measures, either directly or indirectly, and use customer expectations in Vermont sufficient to meet the total aggregated annual requirement assigned to it, pursuant to this section, along with any additional amount achievable through non-compliance payments as described in subdivision 8124F2 of this title. The suggested addition is clean heat credits generated through installed measures delivered by the default delivery agent on behalf of an obligated party are creditable in future years, but not required to meet the obligated party's existing obligations. Uh, <clears throat> that are credible in future years, but not required to meet the obligated party's existing obligations shall be owned by the obligated party. And so what, it, what they're trying to do here is when the DDA um, has, uh, is installing measures and say uh, there is 12 years worth uh, um, creditable, Credits. Oh, okay. 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 So um, it's um, after like the, you know, like the, it may just be for the first three years if that's the DDA. And then afterwards would go to the obligated party. The credits would go to the obligated party. So it, it, it helps the obligated parties, helps to reduce their obligation for the years. Yeah, and so just to remind everyone, so the installed measures will have an expected life, probably 10 to 12 years or somewhere in that range. And so who owns them later in its life if the DDA is the one that installs them? And so because they're going to be using money from an obligated party, the full life of the credits should go to the obligated party. I think that makes sense. Moving on to page 22.
and into actually page 21, I'm um, just noting uh, in B, this is that section that we're talking about working out a uh, number of us um, potentially over the lunch hour or longer. Um, then moving to B on page 22. And this is where we are listing eligible measures. We have a request here, again, the conglomeration of businesses. And also we have a request um, from um, some rural interests. The first is the clean heat measures listed in one that we um, be explicit. I think this is this is assuring language. It's already that we add residential, commercial, industrial, thermal energy efficiency improvements and weatherization. Going to six, again, this is electric appliances, providing thermal end uses. Again, that we would add here, residential, commercial, and industrial uses. Uh, residential, commercial, and industrial, which I think is assuring language. It's not new, it's a new consequence. <clears throat> And then a proposal for a new measure. And remembering that this is a baseline of measures, it is not an exclusive list of measures. It's measures that must be required. Uh, they can elect to add other, other measures. And this one would be line extensions that connect residential, commercial, or industrial facilities with thermal loads to the grid. So we've heard about um, like sugar shacks, for instance, um, and connecting those, uh, and that's actually happened where we've had a sugar maker be connected to the grid to kind of reduce their emissions. So that's a suggested ad from some rural interests. Hmm. Seven. Um, I'm a little slow right now. Is it okay if I ask a clarifying question to Ellen for the previous comment? Yes. Um, so the previous comment, is there any, by adding this reassuring language, um, this is, this is um, thing heat credits uh, that are not used this year, but have a future year value that they, they stay with the obligated party. Um, I can understand this. I, I guess if you state it like that in statute, is there, like, let's say there is a negotiated agreement that the obligated party says, you can, you can have my next, you know, yes, you can have this year's and you can also have the next five years if there's a negotiated agreement there. Because in my experience working at Efficiency Vermont over a decade ago, we would do that sometimes. If we place this language in there like that, does that mean by statute they can't do that? Like, is that accidentally um, restricting the potential negotiated agreements? Hmm. Well, I don't I, think you need to answer that now. Yeah, because I don't, I'm just, we're just walking through it. I'm just. But they can be bought and sold and traded. Right. I think she's asking if the if having it be a shell mm. would prevent bought, sold, trade. And so I think you would probably want, we could make that clear that that's not restricting the DDA or the obligated party from them doing whatever they want with them. Yeah, it's whether or not this is accidentally making it more confining as opposed to clear about the options. Anyway, you don't need to answer that now, but just as I read it, I'm like, uh, and on the line extension, I, I'd love to just think about that a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Could be it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oops. Just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. If you're going to plug these in, could, they, could you plug the new ones in? I'd like to keep the yellow. Okay. Or okay. Color. Just plug them in a different color. Yeah. Oh, multicolored. Oh, yeah, I like that. That's Sorry. a great idea. Thank you. Have a okay. idea. Or you'd like pink or something. I don't something care. white. Yeah, there something like, 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 pink, not teal. Like, like <laughs> Black. Mr. Egg Bunny. That's a <laughs> shirt. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <All right. laughs> no. Thank you. We are um, Sorry, light black. We are going to uh, reconvene at one o'clock today.